All right, let's get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Sebastian Perouz. I'm a research professor working with the Central Asia program at the IRIS, so at George Washington University. So welcome to uh, the Central Asia program seminars. We, today we're going to address the state of civil society uh, in Kyrgyzstan. So uh, before starting, a uh, few brief points here. Uh, first, this uh, seminar is part of a series of uh, Central Asia program seminars on civil society uh, in Central Asia. We had a seminar on Kazakhstan a few months ago, and this seminar on Kyrgyzstan will be followed uh, next year, so in 2022, with uh, seminars on the civil society in all the Central Asian uh, countries. And, uh, that seminars actually aim to address broader uh, development trends and civil society challenges since independence and also recent development. So today we will focus on Kyrgyzstan. Uh, why? Because it seemed uh, important to us to organize a seminar at a time when important political changes have uh, taken place in this country since the coming uh, to power and the election of uh, uh, the new president, Japarov. Second, uh, we are very, very happy today that this seminar is co-organized with the program EUCAM, so Europe Central Asia Monitoring. Uh, this program was uh, established in 2008 to monitor the implementation of the EU Central Asia strategy. I would like to insist on the fact that since its creation, UCAM has been extremely active. So please uh, don't hesitate to visit its website, eucentralasia.eu. You will see uh, the activities conducted by UCAM and also, and especially the, its numerous publications. And here, uh, I would also like to mention UCAM's latest uh, working paper entitled Between Praise and Persecution, Civil Society in, Ka in Kyrgyzstan, which uh, precisely discusses uh, our topic today. Uh, a third point is that uh, this seminar is part of a civil society initiative that we have just launched as a Central Asia uh, program. Very briefly, uh, this initiative has several, several goals, including addressing the diversity of actors, of civil society actors, I mean their objectives and their modes of engagement. We also want to investigate how the Central Asian governments approach civil society and its organization, and also to explore uh, the narratives and the roles of foreign actors in the development of civil society in Central Asia and assess their potential uh, influence in the region through the civil society organization. And you can find more information on this initiative on our Central Asia program website, uh, so Central Asia program org in the uh, initiative section. So now today uh, to discuss the state of civil society in Kyrgyzstan, we have three excellent speakers, e Erika Marat, Begimai uh, Begbolotova, and Jos Bonstra. So each presenter will speak about 15 minutes, then uh, we will have a Q&A session. So please don't hesitate to send your questions in the chat box. So uh, we are uh, going to start with uh, Begimag Begbolotova. Uh, Begimag is from OSH. I mean, she's worked, she has worked in the nonprofit sector uh, of Kyrgyzstan for more than eight years. She has a background in journalism, public relations, and project management. Uh, much of a time to fighting uh, gender-based violence and inequality in Kyrgyzstan. And Biggie Mike recently worked as a consultant for the Center for European Security Studies, CSS, and is a UCAM Research Fellow alumna. So uh, we'll thank you, the three of you, uh, for being here today. And uh, Biggie Mike, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening to Kyrgyzstan. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Um, yeah, and welcome you all. Um, 
So as it was already mentioned, uh, an EU camp program um, of the Center of European Security Studies uh, in the Netherlands published a working paper uh, about um, developments and recent developments um, in Turkish uh, civil society. And uh, yeah, in my uh, speech, I will focus on the findings of um, our paper on, uh, on the position of um, uh, NGO in relation to the government, to the society uh, in Kyrgyzstan. And um, yeah, and I would like to, um, yeah, before starting, I would like to just um, thank EUCAM program uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity to conduct this research and especially to our um, yeah, editor, uh, Jos Bonstam. And yeah, and I would like to just uh, emphasize that, uh, that uh, this research um, has been done by uh, Central Asian women, uh, my colleagues, uh, Ajan Erishova and Irina Kulikova. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if they're here or not today. So uh, yeah, so um, yeah, in this spring when we were um, yeah, doing our interviews for this research, um, the sudden race of uh, Satir Jafarov um, yeah, I was witnessed by civil society um, uh, representatives uh, like with um, suspicion, but also uh, yeah, a bit full of like rejection as well. And for example, in our research, we find out that only eight and a half percent of people were uh, hoping, um, like yeah, were hoping for a positive like or something uh, more uh, like they see that there is more possibilities or liberties uh, in, the, in the future. But yeah, and this number is very low because uh, like last year or this year, um, civil society activists, uh, journalists and human rights defenders and lawyers as well were persecuted by the police, by the security uh, service, and, but also by the unknown people like, um, yeah. And uh, for example, one of our um, respondents said that, um, that this is an act of um, intimidation uh, that uh, so then everyone uh, should see what will happen to the people who are uh, yeah who disagrees with um, uh, with um, the current uh, politician or with current situation as well and um, so Japan's government also um, this year um, adopted um, two laws um, that limits uh, civil freedom the first one is actually um, not a like it's, it's not a new law, but it's a change to a law about uh, NGOs. And based on this, uh, there is a, a new um, reporting, like financial reporting scheme for nonprofit organizations and yeah, and civil society said that it's a persecution on the legislative level. And basically, it means that yeah, now the state has a yeah right like. They can just easily close down NGOs that yeah they, they don't like, and then the second um, law was against uh, fake information or <clears throat> many people call it um, like a censorship tool to protect uh, officials or politicians from criticism, and yeah this law has not been uh, applied yet in practice, uh, but yeah but it it's intimidates people and media and civil society uh, with. Um, internet censorship and yeah in the future it can definitely affect uh, freedom of speech uh, so regarding to the relationship uh, between uh, state and uh, civil society um, yeah unfortunately uh, there is no partnership today and uh, in the recent years the, this negative rhetoric um, yeah regarding to the NGO sector has been increased uh, significantly especially like uh, from atom by of like and after Jean Bekov and now it became uh, yeah, even worse. And for example, recently the deputy chairman of the cabinet of ministers, like a uh, former um, uh, civil society activist, Edil Baisalov, he was saying that, that non-government organizations like NGOs should stop the course of uh, confrontation. And yeah, if they want to cooperate, like if they want a cooperation with the government agencies. And the other interesting uh, findings of our research is that um, our respondents think that they have a strong influence on, on the citizens. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a um, uh, popular support uh, for the cu current government, and, which is like suppressing civil society. 
but yeah, and it means that probably uh, civil society of Kyrgyzstan is um, yeah working with like middle class urban uh, people, but maybe not so good in influencing um, yeah people in the from the rural areas. Um, so and regarding to this, we were making actually. Uh, one of the recommendation um, that uh, civil society needs more uh, positive uh, visibility. I mean, civil, civil society should uh, develop their own narrative or projects on how to counter uh, negative publicity um, and, or how to show that their work uh, or their changes that they're doing in their communities. And um, so, yeah, this is like about the current situation very briefly um, and yeah, all these um, points are like significant rollback from the democratic principles, uh, from the rule of law, from everything that uh, civil society was striving the last uh, 30 years. And yeah, now uh, we can say that there is, um, uh, yeah, there is like authoritarian regime is being established in uh, yeah, Kyrgyzstan. So, and uh, how we can, um, characterize civil society today. Um, some of our respondents uh, were saying that and explaining that before uh, there was a strong view that uh, civil society is the um, NGO sector uh, and the media like citizens or students or like business sector or other parties, they didn't see themselves as a part of civil society. Uh, but um, in 2019, there was a uh, journalistic investigation on um, uh, that un un uncovered a uh, huge uh, corruption system. I mean, corruption scheme in the yeah, it was a reason for um, action or demonstration called um, reaction, like in, in Russian, it's a uh, reaction. So this reaction uh, movement uh, brought uh, these peaceful protesters against corruption. And all these people, like students, like NGO people, and everybody just yeah came together uh, to fight against corruption in the country, uh, in the in this um, in the, uh, state. And um, this reaction was actually a uh, oh, okay. Uh, so this uh, reaction platform was actually a, a good place uh, for to build up this unofficial communities uh, who has like this liberal views that are striving for democratic like state and for rule of law. And yeah, and many of our uh, respondents were emphasizing that uh, this reaction movement uh, changed the view on what civil society is. And then they were emphasizing that civil society is actually like transforming um, right now. And um, <clears throat> also um, I would like to add that um, there is uh, also um, a risk um, depending on what kind of NGO you work for. Uh, if you work, for example, in the human rights organization, there is always a risk that you can be persecuted by the authorities. And uh, yeah, and being ready to um, help uh, civil society or NGO sector to avoid uh, persecution um, uh, was one of our recommendations in our paper. And uh, we were saying that donors should prepare a practical support options for the civil society. And this can include like uh, <clears throat> trainings for the NGO staff on how to um, respond uh, during the uh, interrogations or psychological support for those uh, civil society representatives that are working under the pressure or, or that are working with vulnerable groups or, for example, human rights defenders, they're like a fireman of the civil society in Kyrgyzstan, or a le legal uh, assistance if it's, if it's necessary. And um, yeah, talking about um, uh, civil society or NGO sector, we can also like, categorize it a lot. Like we can say that there is like a new or old generation, there, there is like an urban or rural, or there is modern or yeah, old fashioned, and uh, for example, uh, the progressive part of civil society is of course located in Bishkek and maybe a bit uh, in Osh, um, they're mostly Russian speaking, but there are also other um, active citizens there uh, that they are from the uh, regions or from the villages and they are predominantly Kyrgyz speaking. And um, yeah, and regarding to this, uh, the we were saying, uh, we were writing another uh, recommendation that first is that, um, 
civil society that are mostly located in Bishkek uh, should use Kyrgyz language to be able to influence in the future, like in their region. And this is like an always a hot topic uh, in the NGO sector in Kyrgyzstan. And then the second is that <clears throat> most donors are using um, English as a language of communication, but with uh, yeah, some options of um, yeah, talking uh, and communicate in Russian. But um, yeah, if we want to influence the regions, it is important to use Kyrgyz language and Uzbek language um, and yeah, give more opportunities to the regional NGOs or to support uh, initiatives that are yeah, come from the rural areas of uh, Kyrgyzstan. So um, yeah, and yeah, there is a lot of things to discuss um, and interesting findings that we yeah, but, but that we um, put on our working paper. But I will, I think, <laughs> we'll stop here. Um, and yeah, yours maybe will continue. But at the end, I would like to just say that the work of civil society in Kyrgyzstan is now getting more um, difficult and more dangerous um, in the space for the civil liberties is um, yeah getting smaller and but yeah I would like to stay positive and yeah I, I, I can I, I would like to like believe that this way of, of new uh, like civil activists or this new communities uh, yeah can can become a like a pillar of a store strong established institutions um, in Kyrgyzstan of Kyrgyzstan yeah um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, I'd like to be, I would like to yeah, discuss it later if there's questions. Thank you very much, Peggy Mai. Uh, so our second speaker will be Jos Bonstra, who is a senior researcher and new camp coordinator at the Central Center for European Security Studies, the CSS, which is located, uh, which is based in the Netherlands. Uh, before joining the CSS in 2016, uh, Jos worked as head of the Eastern Europe and Central Asia program at Friday, a think tank uh, with offices in Madrid and Brussels. And at CSS, uh, Jos' research focused uh, uh, on democratization, security and development policies in Eastern Europe, the South Caucasus and Central Asia. Uh, Jos, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Sebastian, and thanks a lot for this opportunity to talk a little bit about our report. Uh, yeah, uh, my uh, objective is to uh, to follow up on uh, what Bechima has just uh, told us about civil society. Uh, maybe as a start, uh, it is quite worrisome uh, what has happened over the last few years in Kyrgyzstan. Um, we seem to almost sort of sleepwalk into uh, an authoritarian regime, and this has already started way before uh, uh, Japarov came to power, the last five to six years. There has already been a downturn in human rights. Uh, it's a sort, and the last few years, it's really a spiral of negative uh, developments. Uh, the referendum on the constitution, uh, several contested elections, uh, a law that is uh, now profoundly uh, anti-NGO, an information law that is very arbitrary, uh, not to speak, of course, of all the uh, economic decline and the tensions over the border with uh, Tajikistan. What I find especially very worrisome and disappointing is the turn from a parliamentary system which was quite new to a, a presidential system how the clock was turned back on that there has not really been an opportunity for a parliamentary culture to uh, to develop a culture in which uh, the authorities are being held accountable for their policies and as this is now going on, we are really seeing uh, slowly how an authoritarian regime is shaking up, is uh, shaping up uh, how uh, the secret services are getting more power, how political opposition is, uh, is being ruled out and set aside, and as there is violence uh, against uh, the political opposition. And the worry is now that in turn, that will of course also affect uh, free media and civil society. Uh, over the last, I think, two or three decades since independence, there has been an understanding in, in Kyrgyzstan, maybe sort of unwritten understanding that uh, civil society had the opportunity to be free, to uh, also do its part socially in uh, stepping in where the state could not provide. And they were allowed to do so by the state, by, by politics. 
And on the other hand, uh, politics uh, gave this freedom and expected from civil society to maybe be not too much involved in politics, not to be too critical on corruption and so on. And meanwhile, both, of course, tapped into international uh, donor funding that has been so crucial uh, to Kyrgyzstan. Um, in the report that we uh, drafted uh, last summer and uh, in, uh, in autumn, uh, we did a lot of interviews, as Begimai already alluded to. Uh, we did a survey and we mostly focused, and that's important to mention here, on, uh, on liberal democratic civil society, on NGOs and on think tanks. We understand that civil society is, of course, of course much broader. Uh, we did not focus on media. We did not focus on labor unions, on uh, uh, Islamic uh, civil society. Uh, so that, that's quite a narrow uh, view that we are focused on. Um, and in that sense, uh, we, we, we asked the civil society representatives what they thought uh, would be uh, important issues to focus on and how their own role uh, was assessed in, in, in the society. We also asked them uh, what they believe uh, uh, donors should focus on, how donors could most effectively uh, support Kyrgyzstan and Kyrgyz civil society. Um, and I think there are those recommendations that we have drafted on the basis of these interviews and the survey can be uh, grouped uh, in, on the three themes. Uh, the first is funding, the second is bureaucracy, and the third is content. To quickly uh, go uh, by these three and the recommendations uh, we came up with, uh, first, under funding, uh, we see that a lot of donors are currently uh, scaling down in Kyrgyzstan or walking even away. And that is, of course, extremely uh, disappointing, especially at this stage. So uh, Kyrgyz civil society needs more funding, not less funding. Also, donors should maybe reassess uh, the balance between uh, funding that goes to uh, the government, to the state, and funding that goes to uh, to the civil uh, sector, um, because some, especially the larger uh, state donors, uh, European Union, United States, uh, often see uh, the support of civil society as a small appendix of the the larger, uh, often budget support funding that's going to the state. But how effective can this budget support be at this point? This is something that the bigger donors really need to consider at this point, and maybe make a shift by uh, more uh, provision to, uh, to civil society and maybe a little bit less to uh, a government from which we uh, do really not know if we can uh, expect implementation. Another concern that uh, a lot of civil society actors have is their daily work uh, in which uh, they are constantly working fundraising, implementation, reporting, and then the cycle repeats again. So donors will really need to, to think about this cycle of short-term versus long-term funding to make sure that uh, civil society and NGOs think tanks that really have uh, a right to be there and really have something good going that they can count on support. And not only uh, that they can deepen their, uh, their activities uh, and their work. Uh, a last uh, concern under the funding header uh, was knowledge transfer. Uh, some uh, NGO people uh, alluded to uh, the often lack of knowledge transfer in working with international think tanks and NGOs. So it would be good if donors, for instance, uh, offer the opportunity of fellowships or of training of trainer programs that uh, this cooperation continues also on the longer term. And they were quite critical uh, towards uh, consultancies uh, from Europe, from the US, that are short-term involved in Kyrgyzstan. This happens in a lot of other countries as well. They write their reports, they do their projects quickly, and they move on to the next one. Uh, and that you can almost see as a sort of knowledge grab instead of a knowledge transfer. Uh, under the second header of bureaucracy, um, 
there is of course a wish by uh, NGOs to have a little bit less bureaucracy by uh, the donors. Um, often uh, quite in-depth audits are demanded, uh, which uh, makes sense because it helps NGOs to mature. But uh, then there should also be provisions for training or for these audits to be paid for by the donor. Uh, practices like demanding co-funding uh, are often quite uh, problematic for NGOs, in, especially smaller NGOs in raising funding. Um, what is also interesting is that a lot of donors have come to understand that small civil society organizations need an income. And this, I think, the, the COVID crisis has shown that uh, a lot of projects were halted and a lot of funding that normally is spent on travel and on recommendation and on events, all of a sudden uh, needed to be used for just paying people to sit behind desks. And donors started to understand that visibility is not only paid by uh, by uh, large-scale uh, in-person events, but that it's actually uh, people sitting behind desks and doing stuff, that this also needs to be paid. Because this is uh, uh, our recommendation in the bureaucracy uh, point, that donors take these uh, matters into account. Lastly, on content, uh, there is really a, a tendency uh, uh, for donors, especially the larger uh, 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 donors like the EU and the US, maybe a little bit less so under the private donors like Open Society, Akakan, to uh, push down their own agenda. It's often long term agendas that uh, European member states or the EU bureaucracy has, and that often doesn't give much flexibility to uh, NGOs uh, on the ground. So often they're focusing on the wrong issues. Um, they are too late on issues, and sometimes this can also result in NGOs being seen as uh, as, as working for the donor, uh, for the visibility of the donor, not being able to, to set our own agenda, be independent and work directly uh, with the population. An issue that Begemai also uh, <coughs> mentioned already, all these problems of uh, civil society often becoming quite uh, detached from society itself. So it would be good if there's a little bit more freedom uh, given by donors in the subjects uh, and the issues that civil society organizations uh, focus on. As a conclusion, um, there's also a sort of regional aspect to this. Um, I think that it's really crucial for a key civil society to stay very active and healthy because it also fulfills a regional function. Bishkek is a sort of regional meeting place for, uh, Central, for Central Asian civil society organizations. Regional meetings take place, there's a lot of uh, education, uh, universities that are sort of meeting places for international and Central Asian civil society organizations and for higher education. And this is why it's so important for donors to stay active uh, and uh, keep uh, helping uh, civil society to make a difference in Kyrgyzstan. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Yes. Uh, just before moving on to our third speaker, Erika, I just would like to remind that if you have any of you has any question, please uh, feel free to send that uh, in the chat box. So our next speaker uh, is Erika, Erika Marat, who is a national associate professor at the College of International Security Affairs at the Defense, National Defense University. Her research focuses on violence, mobilization, and security institutions in Eurasia, India, and Mexico. And uh, before joining uh, the NDU, uh, Erika was a visiting scholar at the Ken Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Her let and her latest book uh, uh, titled The Politics of Police Reform, Society Against the State in post soviet Countries was published by Oxford University Press in 2018. And Erika also co-edited a very recently released uh, volume by Rutledge. Uh, entitled The Rutledge Handbook of Contemporary Central Asia. So, Erika, thank you for being with us today, and the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Sebastian, and thank you so much, uh, Vigima and Jos, uh, for inviting me today. I read the report. I'm really excited. I really recommend everyone to read it. It's the latest survey. Uh, what I really appreciated, in addition to really thoughtful recommendations and reflections on the general state of society, and this uh, Jos uh, mentions that um, the liberal democratic uh, part of the civil society um, community in, in Kyrgyzstan, um, I appreciated how we can hear the voices um, of civil society activists uh, as well in, in the report, and especially uh, the survey that you've conducted of um, uh, NGOs uh, in Kyrgyzstan. So there are lots of um, uh, conclusions in the report that I really agree on. I, I think it does a good job of, by starting uh, the report by explaining how the pandemic and inadequate uh, government, go governance in Kyrgyzstan really played a big role um, in the 2020 uh, developments uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan um, and um, ascent of Japarov to power. Uh, but also uh, how NGOs in Kyrgyzstan are really the backbone of civil society and how they are engaged in such a wide variety of issues from fighting for human rights uh, to um, responding to the aftermath of the um, conflict uh, with, uh, between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan to environmental concerns. And I personally also did research on how civil society activists participate in trying to uh, reform police forces in Kyrgyzstan. So uh, this is great. And uh, some of the more, um, uh, some, some of the insightful comments I found that also really uh, correlate with what I've been hearing in Kyrgyzstan on the work of international organizations and international donors that support NGOs. And we hear it again and again that uh, grants are given, especially by large international organizations, uh, uh, UN type organizations, uh, grants are given to um, distributed among networks of friends um, and kind of supporting uh, nepotist relations so within uh, civil society activists or civil society groups. Um, I also agree on the bureaucracy um, that there is this um, uh, culture of writing reports for international organizations, uh, international NGOs, and a lot of energy is spent on just that, on writing re huge reports. Um, sometimes I would also have to add, sometimes those reports are not even publicized. They are just used by the uh, donors themselves, they're not shared with the public or uh, they're also not shared among donors. And what we see sometimes, uh, and this is, this is sort of the uh, frequent critique I hear is that sometimes donors, they rep uh, replicate, they overlap in what they do. Um, and in, in that sense, um, resources are wasted, uh, but they, they replicate each other's work um, because um, of how they respond uh, to um, their, their headquarters, uh, wherever that might be, New York, uh, Brussels, uh, Geneva, uh, but it, because they also don't share with each other. So a lot of, if, if they just shared a little more of knowledge with each other from, from surveys, from qualitative research, maybe uh, we wouldn't see as much of replication of the same, um, same reports. Um, and here also comes the idea that um, it is a kind of, uh, we do see from large organizations. And it's just not, it's not just the case of Kyrgyzstan, of course, that there's this cookie cutter approach uh, by large organizations in terms of what is, um, what is it that they're looking for uh, to understand in Kyrgyzstan and how, where the, do they engage in Kyrgyzstan. So I, so with all that, this is a fantastic report of a really, complex um, community in Kyrgyzstan. And I agree with what Yemai says that um, it, it looks like that a lot of NGOs uh, are doing a better job in reaching out and kind of socializing um, the urban community as opposed to really reaching out to rural communities. And in rural communities, the type of engagement is sometimes different. It's more uh, based on, uh, it's sometimes it's focused not so much on um, civic liberties um, or human rights or so democracy values, all the liberal values that are familiar to us, but more on humanitarian needs, on post-conflict needs or something related just to crisis situations. Um, and that maybe needs to be a better, um, um, 
analyzed uh, by civil society actors in Kyrgyzstan. So, and here's what, um, where I, I, I think that the uh, report can further expand in our research of civil society groups, even if we're just focusing on, again, on this liberal democratic civil society in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and let me just use this opportunity and plug in that uh, Sebastian and I mean, the city dean of Sosko St. Piruz and the city dean just published a fantastic report on Islamic civil society um, in uh, Central Asia. So I think it's really complementary to what uh, the Yemai and Yos are presenting today. Um, but let me, um, you know, let me just mention uh, um, this one, my major critique. Uh, and even though you do define liberal democratic civil society as NGOs, in Kyrgyzstan, and that is true that PNGOs are the backbone of society in Kyrgyzstan. We do see really in the, in the last decade, we see such a huge variety of different other types of civil society groups that are not necessarily NGOs and more so they don't want to be NGOs. They stay away from becoming NGOs. So Ryakza is one of those really vivid examples of how they did everything not to become an NGO. I mean, there were many other problems of course with Ryakza, which we can discuss a lot more, but it's, um, um, I think to an extent we have to be honest with our, ourselves that NGOs do not no longer mean uh, just the positive. I, I think you mentioned that as well, a po positive, this feel good, righteous uh, thing in Kyrgyzstan. And some activists are consciously trying to stay away from the, the, these labels um, of NGOs. And they're doing a fantastic job. Um, there are lots of um, um, ad hoc actions, uh, campaigns, uh, by um, collectives or um, and you know ranging from political collectives or fighting for um, free and fair elections to let's say feminist collectives um, to LGBTQ uh, I plus uh, collectives that are trying to fight for various um, rights and uh, political representation. But there are also there is this phenomenon uh, of individual activists, and they might be members of NGOs or other organizations, but they really act. They have their own agendas, and they they're really active in promoting um, their um, their vision and representing their communities. Um, and those um, individual activists, um, they range. You know, there are quite a few of them participating in efforts to reform police forces. But there is also individuals like or you know, professionals like uh, um, uh, um, who who is uh, talking about, for instance, revising uh, the historic memory. And it's a political it's a political act, a historic memory in Kyrgyzstan. And she has uh, this project as SMD. She does have her own, uh, I think, a think think tank of her own organization. But um, at the same time, uh, her work is influential and it is civil society um, type of uh, engagement of um, kind of, you know, decolonizing Kyrgyzstan from um, the historical narrative that is prevalent uh, up to date. And that these kind of um, projects, they, they, they target, um, you know, they, they, they try to engage with the national consciousness, the national identity um, of, um, of, of, and I try, trying to define um, what is the, um, um, what, what is the civic and what is the national identity uh, for, for Kyrgyzstan today. And then there are lots of arts, uh, pro art projects uh, that we know of that also are really, uh, they can be spontaneous, they're not part of an NGO, but of NGOs, but uh, they promote just really powerful uh, messages about uh, women's rights, about uh, colonial past or col um, colonial violence in Kyrgyzstan. And they are not NGOs, but they do promote with something uh, that we think as uh, liberal values um, in Kyrgyzstan. That they, they also need support. They also need support and they also need engagement. But let me talk about what kind of engagement they actually need, not always necessarily uh, the type of uh, support that NGOs need. Um, so then there are also, of course, uh, socially uh, conscious, uh, social, socially responsible entrepreneurs in Kyrgyzstan who try to promote um, uh, education and technologies among uh, urban and rural communities. Um, they, they are also civil society. They don't call themselves NGOs, but they are promoting market values um, and uh, political and economic rights of citizens. 
Um, and sometimes they're even more, more influential, more, more impactful than um, established NGOs in Kyrgyzstan as well. Um, and then there's, of course, more, again, ad hoc networks of groups like uh, Druzhiniki, um, who are mostly, uh, mostly men, but also women, uh, who uh, look, for, uh, look to establish uh, social and legal order um, um, in large cities during political calamities. Um, and in October 2020, we saw how this network was incredibly effective in, uh, in trying to, um, of course, they were not as effective as prevent, to prevent uh, certain people to break out from jail, but they were effective in preventing, let's say, looting um, uh, in Bishkek. Um, so these kind of NGOs, uh, these kind of civil society groups are also very important to understand um, in, in the context of Kyrgyzstan as well. So, and um, what, what, what's different about um, these type of activists, let's say entrepreneurs or individual activists who, who work with uh, the Ministry of Interior, um, there, there are actually, I would argue, there are more connections between them and the government. They are, they know the limitations of the government and governance in certain agencies in Kyrgyzstan. And they are trying to find ways to engage with what, whatever they have. <laughs> um, they're very skeptical about what they have. Uh, let's say in the interior ministry, uh, what kind of contacts they have there, but it is what it is and they are trying to build connections. And in that sense, they're more adaptive and more flexible than, than NGOs. Um, and they, they do make uh, a certain impact um, in the functions of those agencies. Again, by far not uh, what they would want to see, but it is more than uh, maybe more organized uh, groups can do, like like NGOs, who in turn are also um, they have um, a bigger institutional agenda when when they promote certain reforms or changes. And in that sense, um, this kind of activists, so uh, the liberal democratic uh, civil society in Kyrgyzstan, um, they of course they they need all you know the funds. Um, both uh, what, what Yos has been saying, uh, short-term and long-term engagement, uh, funding is important always, no matter um, what kind of activity those groups are engaged in. Uh, but what they also, also need, uh, so again, those more ad hoc NGOs, is knowledge, is sharing of knowledge. Um, and by that, I mean a building networks with similar activists um, in other parts of the world. Uh, be that um, in form of Soviet space or uh, in Europe or in global, global South, um, where other networks, similar networks, can share uh, knowledge and how do they set up, let's say, an IT um, school? Or how do they set up um, a school that would allow um, 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 uh, young uh, men and women to learn about um, um, AI technologies, right? Or how do, um, what is the best way to attract, uh, to, to perform uh, a powerful message against corruption? Um, what, would, what are the means, how do we do that? How do we, how, what is the best way? And also, sh you know, sharing own uh, experience with other parts of the world. So kind of this socializing, um, so socializing effort and trying to share own ideas, get ref reflections on them um, and also learn from others. What is it they are doing? So uh, money, money is good, but I think knowledge is also an important part of um, developing. Uh, civil society in Kyrgyzstan going forward. Um, and with that, again, um, I really, really recommend everyone to read this report um, and really congratulations with the report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erika, for your excellent comments. So I think I'm going to be taking the questions. I'm going to uh, let uh, Beggy and Yos a few minutes if they wish to, to answer uh, Erika's comments. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to respond. Uh, shall I start? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Erika. Uh, and 
yeah, it was very positive. Thanks that you enjoyed the report, that you see it useful, and uh, the criticism you had, it's, it's exactly right. Uh, and the points you made is also uh, maybe the most positive thing to think about civil society, that the landscape is extremely, extremely vibrant. A lot is going on. And a lot is going on, not on paved roads, but around uh, these paved roads. People are creative. And I think that is really the legacy of all this activism in the last 20, 30 years. So that is definitely positive news, uh, I, I, I think. Um, in that sense, yeah, there is almost a not NGO civil society sector uh, uh, online in movements and so on. Um, briefly on donors, I saw uh, one comment uh, in the chat uh, that just said, usual suspects. Uh, and this is a good comment, I think. Uh, it's often the case. Uh, it happens in a lot of countries. And, uh, it's often is the result of, of just not enough effort being put into identifying uh, uh, recipients by the donors. And for uh, and it, 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 it's it's an issue for public donors and for private donors because private donors that are often based in the country are present on the ground. They are often uh, uh, accused of favorism of knowing uh, the NGOs, of knowing personally the people running these NGOs, and of course wanting to help these people and then constantly delivering grants to the same uh, people. The same uh, applies to the larger public uh, uh, donors, uh, the EU, European member states, the US, um, where it's quite difficult to fill in a, a grant form to send in a proposal to meet all the criteria and that just a few people, uh, often a few directors in civil society that know the trick, that know how to fill in these forms, that know how to be accountable. Uh, if you know this trick, it's gold because you often win the same grants and it's just a few people. And so there are two sorts of usual suspects uh, in, 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 in this uh, sense. And I think it's just, uh, it, there should be more efforts uh, by donors to identify the right people. Uh, and that takes uh, a lot of time and money. Uh, but it, it, it is a problem and it's difficult to solve, uh, definitely. Um, yeah, I saw, can I answer one thing that I saw in the chat, Sebastian? Um, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was one remark uh, on, on populism and uh, the anti-NGO narrative. Uh, maybe Bechemeike can look at that. On this anti-LGBT uh, uh, issues and uh, anti-feminist uh, issues, and if this also happens in, in other countries, definitely yes. Uh, this is the case uh, in Eastern Partnership or in, in Eastern Europe, in the Caucasus, uh, Georgia, and there's a lot of cases in this. Uh, Ukraine, there are a lot of cases, and in the case in, in events in Ukraine, where I spoke with organizations, for instance, that work on, on projects, their complaint was often that donors, again, uh, define how they should do their projects on what and when and how. And that is often very risky for these organizations that probably know best themselves how to address uh, the issues they want to focus on. So there is an enormous risk of, of organizations being pushed through projects, uh, 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 coming in the news, uh, addressing issues that are extremely sensitive in these societies. And their NGOs themselves should decide how to approach these issues, and they should have the freedom to do so. Just one remark I wanted to make about the question. Thanks. Thank you, yes. Biggie Mai, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, yeah, I absolutely agree with Erika because now the civil society is really, um, yeah, being it's very vibrant and transforming. And sometimes there is like stuff happening that is really not like I wouldn't expect that. Like that, for example, last year the people who go outside and protect the city from the, yeah, from the from the riots, for example. And yeah, this is really surprising. And yeah, this means that. Um, 
yeah, people started to be more conscious and yeah, more more maybe like um, active uh, in terms of like uh, what's happening in the country. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I think this is like new, uh, um, like this plast of uh, civil society that are growing now. It's like a good um, subject to to research and to look uh, on like how uh, this suddenly happens uh, happened in Kyrgyzstan. And um, yeah, and regarding to the uh, yeah, this uh, questions uh, about, about anti-feminist and anti-LGBT, yeah, this is like a problem I think in almost uh, all the countries where uh, yeah, women's rights are not really uh, respected, um, and especially in Kyrgyzstan and in the neighboring countries as well. Um, yeah, this um, anti-feminist um, narrative are used in the media uh, to yeah to broadcast like the, the this kind of negative um, yeah emotions uh, from the from the people. Um, yeah, yeah, and um, also um, I would like to just add about like the funding, uh, for example. Even in Kyrgyzstan, uh, for the feminist organizations, it's very hard to get funding because for some international NGOs, like what feminist organizations are doing is too too radical because they see that this all um, like how people are reacting uh, to the like uh, to the uh, projects that are funded by like that are implemented by uh, feminist organizations, and they are so afraid. Uh, to lose their image or to like to damage their image, so then, yeah, they don't want to, for example, cooperate with, uh, yeah, with LGBT uh, or with feminist organizations. And usually, um, yeah, feminist organizations are getting funding abroad, like from the donors that are not in Kyrgyzstan but somewhere in Europe or in the US. Like this is like the additions that I would like to say. Thank you so much, uh, Biggie Maria. So I received a question on the image on, uh, uh, of the NGOs, uh, which have uh, which has largely deteriorated in Central Asia and maybe especially in Kyrgyzstan, as uh, they are often associated with Western political influence and even Kyrgyzstani political instability. I mean, uh, some of them have been accused of being behind revolution. So. How do you explain uh, the degradation of this image? To what extent do you consider the West to be responsible for this degradation of uh, the image of the NGOs? And you know, what can be done to remedy it? I mean, uh, I know you make a lot of recommendations already in your report, but we do have some specific recommendations on this point. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, just very briefly, I, I, this, has a, this is not something typical for Kyrgyzstan, I think. Uh, we see this also in Western Europe. Uh, and I think it's the result of, of this trend of populism, this, uh, this wave of populist uh, uh, politicians that grasp any opportunity uh, to, to create fear, uh, to, to make sure that uh, new people go vote out of fear. And using NGOs in this sense as, as a scapegoat is not typical, I think, uh, to Kyrgyzstan. It also happens in Western Europe. It happens uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, what we see that in Kyrgyzstan at the moment is it's quite extreme. And the only remedy that I, or in the report that we come up with is give more freedom to these NGOs, but also to the new initiatives by donors not promoting their own visibility, but let NGOs uh, promote their visibility. So uh, no grand events that is uh, funded by this or that donor, but uh, more quiet funding that can help uh, civil initiatives uh, to do their work and be part of the society, uh, not uh, being framed in opposition to society. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, everywhere in Central Asia, but not only in Central Asia, but in a number of authoritarian or semi-authoritarian countries, we've seen the emergence of a growing number of gongos, so government-organized NGOs, which are 
uh, active both inside the country, but also outside the country, for example, uh, in international organizations. So uh, could you say a few words about the role of the Congos in the specific context of Kyrgyzstan? To what extent uh, is their presence strong or not? What is their role? And also, says Congos are often uh, strongly criticized for their close links with the state, but at the same time, do you consider their role uh, entirely or very negative? And to what extent should external funders actually cooperate with these kind of girls? I mean, any of you? Um, I can try, uh, because my, maybe you know better. Um, I don't think Kyrgyzstan really has uh, gongos. So if they if there are uh, gongos, then they're not really effective or visible. I think that's just because Kyrgyzstan does not as, have as much um, funding to be able to afford that uh, kind of. I mean, there there is research institute uh, within the government, but I don't think it's uh, it's it's gongo. Um, I think. Uh, um, I, I, I think what we do have is maybe sometimes um, NGOs and activists, they, um, they collude with some politicians and they try not to critique others, uh, other politicians. So that when we see a bit of a political submissiveness, but it's nowhere to be compared to the extent of Gongo um, ization like we see in, let's say, in Kazakhstan or in Uzbekistan. Um, so I don't think um, there, the, I don't think there are those visible gongos in Kyrgyzstan, just because maybe government can't afford that. Uh, yes. I agree with that. Yeah. Now it's uh, these gongos. It's quite a phenomenon of uh, petro states, of states with a lot of oil and gas uh, revenue. Uh, so you see it in Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, they are quite famous for their, uh, for their big think tanks with lots of money uh, that also try to influence policies uh, in Washington and Brussels and, and elsewhere. Uh, what, what is uh, a phenomenon that you see more and more in, in Eastern Europe and in Central Asia is the anti-democratic uh, NGO or civil society. So extremely conservative or extremely pro-Russian uh, uh, NGOs and, and, and movements. And that is a big question, I think. Uh, uh, completely exclude them or talk with them. Uh, that, that, uh, that will be a challenge, I think, over the coming years. Um, yes, yes, I think this is a, such an important point. I'm, I'm glad that you brought it up. So Kurkchoro uh, is uh, the vivid example of this kind of, and you know, we can't include them in civil society. They're not civil, they're uncivil. They're the opposite of civil society. Um, and they do collude, they're, they're, you know, there are multiple open source reports on, on their collusion with, um, uh, and evidence, in fact, uh, collusion with law enforcement agencies, yes. Yeah, um, I would like to just add that, uh, yeah, I agree that the, in Kyrgyzstan there is no Congo. Um, but yeah, but uh, recently uh, um, Edil Baisala, for example, say it was saying that we should stop uh, this foreign funding and then Kyrgyz uh, government will give more fundings to the civil society and so on. So I don't know, like, of course, like Kyrgyzstan is so poor that, uh, yeah, like it, can, it cannot, like Kyrgyz economy cannot afford like civil society in this way. But yeah, maybe uh, in the future we can, um, uh, yeah, see this kind of uh, picture in Kyrgyzstan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, we're getting close to the end of this event. So maybe a, a question, a, a clarification, actually, in your report, I mean, some of uh, one of your interviewees mentioned that there are about 7,000 NGOs officially uh, registered and about 130 and 150 organizations active. Uh, it seems to be very low. I mean, would you have any figures about the number of registered NGOs and on active NGOs? In Kyrgyzstan, of course. Uh, there are there are like in different resources. There is a lot. There are a lot of like uh, numbers of how many NGOs in, in, in Kyrgyzstan, but this is not exactly like seven thousand or five thousand. Like now we can see that um, the active NGOs is not that much. I mean, uh, yeah, probably I don't know. I don't want to say the numbers, but it's not more than fifty or hundred. 
okay, not more than 100, but active ones are really 50, probably, um, yeah, in all over the Kyrgyzstan. And yeah, in my opinion, it happened uh, like before uh, there was a lot of fundings, um, that, like a lot of donors were actually supporting small NGOs in the regions. And that's why like the number and at the time in the 2000s, probably a lot of people who, yeah, who could like kind of deal with uh, project uh, proposals, like with writing project proposals, they were kind of um, getting funding, but uh, the, uh, the way how now donors are giving money is so strict that like, yeah, barely like few organizations can afford uh, all these processes and yeah, can apply to, the, to their requirement as well. So uh, yeah, right now, yeah, it's just few NGOs that, uh, in, uh, that are active actually. And they're mostly also in Bishkek uh, with yeah, some representatives in the region. Okay, thank you very much. And just before concluding, uh, do, you, uh, do you have any plan to do similar survey on all the Central Asian countries that you, you can? That was a, a question. And then I'll give you a chance if you want to add anything on, uh, on the topic. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. Um, no, we don't have very concrete plans at the moment, but we have the possibility and we would love to, uh, to do more uh, sim uh, similar reports on the other countries. We also have the network to do so uh, with our fellowship program. Uh, we have now uh, alumni fellows uh, in all five Central Asian countries that we uh, often engage in uh, small research projects. So uh, that works uh, quite well for us. And also, of course, in cooperation with the Central Asia program that also have their fellow, fellow alumni, uh, these sort of reports uh, are possible and in cooperation with civil society organizations in the region. So yeah, we hope to, uh, to do more of these, uh, these projects. One other uh, uh, thing to mention, and also as maybe as a last point from my side, I saw uh, one remark uh, in the chat about uh, environmental and wildlife uh, civil society organizations. And I think there is really a growth in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan uh, by focusing on environmental issues. We did a little bit of research uh, on mountainous areas in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and uh, we see that a lot of organizations are active there and get a lot of support. And uh, this would be, of course, uh, a new way to, uh, to also uh, uh, work with civil society. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. Biggie Mai, Erika, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just hope that like regarding to the donors that, uh, yeah, um, a lot more uh, regional NGOs will actually um, get more funding and uh, be able to work in the future because now in the villages, um, there is no NGOs or there is no activities and then all this stuff is being replaced by uh, by mosques and by, yeah, let's say this sport, uh, sport, sport clubs are uh, like built by some politicians. Um, and that they are like teaching them their own values and views on um, yeah on the how the, the Kyrgyzstan should be in the future and stuff like that. So yeah, I just hope that in the we will just have like uh, more vibrant um, organizations in the future and there are more regional um, yeah representation. Thank you. Erika, do you want to add? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just, uh, just a couple of words that um, there's really a disconnect between uh, civil society, the complexity and sophistication of civil society in Kyrgyzstan and just utter ineffectiveness of government in Kyrgyzstan. And a lot of the times, and the pandemic was a prime example when the government ceased to exist and civil society took over the traditional uh, roles of the state. Uh, it's, not, it's not an ideal situation, of course, but I think Kyrgyzstan is uh, in, its, in the current shape and the current economic development largely because of the very active uh, civil society. So thank you so much. Unfortunately, we need to conclude. So I would really like to thank the three of you for your presentations, for your discussions. I mean, civil society in Kyrgyzstan is definitely a topic that raises many uh, questions, many, many debates, and not only the Kyrgyz uh, civil society, but all Central Asian civil society. So we're going to follow that on the Central Asia program with 
uh, upcoming seminars uh, on, on this topic. So thank you again. Uh, I would like to thank our three speakers. I would like to thank also our audience for being with us today. And we look forward to having you again in one of our uh, upcoming uh, Central Asian program seminars. Thank you very much. Have a good day or have a good evening. Uh, but goodbye. Thank you very much.